When a director needs action in a scene, he calls the Hollywood stunt makers. Today on Hollywood Stunt Makers, we'll meet some of the top action adventure stars and learn why some of them do their own stunts. We'll also trace the history of stunt making and find out how the need for the stunt double came about. Plus, we'll take a behind the scenes look at the career of John Claude Van Damme, an action superstar who combines his acting skills with his athletic talents to create some of the most exciting martial arts films on screen today. Hollywood has been producing action films ever since they discovered audiences loved them. Out of these films came adventure stars. Here's one of today's biggest, Bruce Willis. In the high-tech action thriller, Die Hard 2. wants to do his stunts himself and sometimes uh, Charlie and I have to calm him down and tell him not to do them because we want to keep him alive and well so that we can shoot also the following day. We have a scene where we actually fly a real helicopter over the wing of a real 747 and I jump out of it onto the wing and we proceed to have a huge fight with, with two different guys on the wing of a moving 747. I don't think that's ever been done. The uh, snow actually turned out to be one of the characters in the film. We had to move three or four times to actually, we had to kind of chase the snow. That was really, you know, the challenge for us was to see whether or not we could, we could match or top what we did in this, in this huge, huge action film. How can the same thing happen to the same guy twice? I am once again in a place that is, that happens to be taken over by terrorists. There's only one way to really make it look like you're trying to kill someone, and that is to try and kill them. In the early days of motion pictures, directors and producers discovered a pretty girl, a dastardly villain, and a fearless hero could sell lots of popcorn. The romantic king of the silent screen, Rudolph Valentino, swept women off their feet, yet also appealed to action-adventure film enthusiasts. Movie theater operators were hard-pressed to satisfy the insatiable appetites of an ever-growing audience. Fast-moving action scenes pulled the audience right into the story. D.W. Griffith's 1915 classic, The Birth of a Nation, the single most important film in the evolution of motion pictures, overnight this movie won worldwide respect for the medium and raised it from a mere novelty entertainment to an art form. Movies were short and silent. The story had to be right up there on the screen. Heroes were brave, fearless, and most of all, physical. They jumped onto moving trains had swashbuckling sword fights. A shootout or two. And that was all before lunch. Stars usually perform their own stunts. Chicago businessman Max Aronson transformed himself into Bronco Billy Anderson. Bronco Billy made hundreds of two-wheeler westerns and his first job as a bit player in Thomas Edison's The Great Train Robbery. Anderson claimed to be an expert horseman. After mounting the horse from the wrong side and later being thrown off, his deception was quite apparent, and he was shifted to on-foot activity for the rest of the two-reel epic.
He eventually learned to ride well enough and occasionally even leaped onto a horse. America fell in love with the Western hero. Tom Mix became one of the screen's biggest stars and insisted on doing all of his own stunts. This made the studio heads unhappy and kept studio doctors busy. During his long career, Tom broke both ankles, both hands, each leg four times, cracked several ribs, and had to have both of his shoulders wired together. Silent screen star Buster Keaton, named Buster by escape artist Harry Houdini, used most of his films to explore his fascination with machines. This scene from The General has to be one of Keaton's most impressive sequences for a number of reasons. Not only because it was meticulously staged and choreographed, but that's really Keaton performing his own stunts. No trick photography here, that's a real train traveling at high speed involving real explosions. Steamboat Bill Jr. Again, Keaton doing his own complicated gags. As you can tell from this scene, he was an innovator of early visual effects involving flyaway walls and wind machines. Keaton also made great use of his acrobatic skills, which were developed during his early days on the vaudeville stage. In this stunt, Keaton had to practically stand on a dime to ensure his safety. The building falls around him without a hitch, making this dangerous stunt look simple. His gags were not only brilliantly imaginative, but staged and timed perfectly. One of the first superstars to emerge on film was Douglas Fairbanks. Fairbanks was an accomplished athlete and loved doing his own stunts. Sometimes, while shooting the action scenes, things got a little out of hand. In one of Fairbanks' films, he took on five extremely tough extras in a fight scene. Apparently, they really got into their roles. After the scene, filming had to be shut down for several days for the swelling on Fairbanks' face to go down. These kind of problems led studios to hire stuntmen. The work was dangerous because few were trained for it. Most stunt people were originally hopeful actors who hung around Gower Gulch looking for work in the movies. This rural-looking setting on the corner of Gower Street and Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood is now the bustling site of a major movie studio and showbiz eatery where many industry power brokers make their deals. D.W. Griffith's masterpiece, Intolerance. The scope of this movie still hasn't been matched today. It was one of the first films to employ thousands of extras. Between 1925 and 1930, 10,794 people were injured in California film productions. 55 died. In 1929, alone, 16 men were killed. 
the 30s and 40s, a whole new breed of action hero burst onto the screen. It became too dangerous for the studios to risk the lives of their major stars. People like Errol Flynn, John Wayne, Gary Cooper and others were no longer permitted to do all their own stunts. They needed to be protected. Hollywood created a new occupation, the stunt double. Let's talk to stuntman Tom Morgan, stunt double. There's always the situation that uh, an actor thinks he'll do all his own stunts, and uh, there are some that are very handy and can do a lot of things, but there's two factors involved. Number one, uh, the, the actor probably, while he's capable, hasn't, hasn't made a living at doing action, and it may not be what he thinks it's going to be. And the other side of the coin is the producer and everybody involved in the film. They can't afford to take a chance with an actor. If he were to get hurt, then the whole production is shut down. So uh, for insurance reasons and others, you really need the stuntman to do the action. I hurt myself pretty badly on the last one, shut down production for about six weeks uh, while my back was repaired. That's on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But uh, since then, uh, been okay. If not for the stunt double, perhaps even Ronald Reagan wouldn't have made it to Washington. As the business of stunt doubling flourished, those who performed these stunts began to make a name for themselves. Many stars had the same stunt double for years. Probably the most famous was Yakima Canute, John Wayne's double for most of Duke's long career. I'll have you out of here in no time. The thrills that stunt doubles provide are often very risky. Yet Yakima Canute was always up to the task. The reason actors like to do their own stunts is that it ensures the reality of the scene adds to the integrity of the character. And take it from me, it's always exciting. And sometimes it can be really scary. It's just a dirty job. You know, I mean, the things are calculated so that there's uh, little risk of real injury, and uh, it's uh, bumps and bruises go with the territory. But uh, I think we get some very important moments when I do it myself. I think we have great moments of, uh, of humor and characterization that occur in the midst of physical action that a bit characterizes these films. Uh, often in an action-adventure film, uh, you lose uh, sight of your protagonist. You're on the back of the head of some of a stunt person. And if I can do it, I'm very happy to do it myself because of because of those opportunities. Uh, it, it's like James Brown started off his career doing a split. I have started off my career doing a push-up, and it seems like if I don't do it, it's a bad omen. And the films I've done, so many of them have been quite physical. So it's just it's it's just an extension of my work. Delta Force Two was my most physical film, I think, of my career of the skydiving and the mountain climbing, the fight scenes, which I do a lot of in Delta Force II. I've been doing, I've been doing for 30 years, so that's not hard to do because I'm so adept at that. But when I get involved in, in things that I'm not adept at, such as skydiving and mountain climbing, then it's a different type of physical exertion. And that's where my training really comes into play there is when I have to climb a 2,000 foot mountain, then I have to really be in good physical shape. And I'd never climbed mountains before. And uh, even though I had a safety line, safety line hooked onto the side, so if I did fall, it would grab me and, and uh, swing you around the side of the mountain. But the idea of falling even an inch, looking down and seeing nothing below me, and knowing that if I fell, that would swing, swing me around the mountain, wasn't something I wanted to do. So I was hanging on for dear life. There has been stunts that I haven't done because it was way, way too dangerous. And well, the snatch in this film, you know, grabbing the man, was way too dangerous for me to do.
The man who filmed that had done all the James Bond movies and all the stuff here, and he said it's one of the most spectacular skydiving scenes he has ever photographed. I've gotten such tremendous joy out of working out and going to the gym and working out with the guys and lifting weights and pumping iron and all those things. I love running, I love bicycle riding and all this stuff. And all I have to do is really find out from the director on each particular film that I do, what kind of shape does he see me in in this film? By the end of the day, where most of the people are tired and have to live on coffee, I am still full of energy, and it's because of the weight training and because of the physical fitness stuff. I think the audience enjoys seeing their, their um, hero actually in the frame doing the stunt. I think physically I'm able, and I trust myself, to do a lot of th things that are a little bit dangerous where you know if something goes wrong, you have to be quick enough to adjust and have enough coordination to get out of it. Well, that's the moronic side of me. <laughs> Somehow, I, I find myself, you know, the, usually the actor says, I don't want to do that. Give me the close-up and give me my money and let me go home. But Carl says, blah, 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 you want me to run through that thing over there? I'll run through it, sure. I'll show you I can do it as good as any stuntman. They say, Carl, Carl, wait a minute. Don't do that. Don't do that. You can get hurt. No, I can't. I can't get hurt, it's impossible, because I'm a good athlete. I can do it, I can show you I can do it. They're going, Carl, but let me tell you something, this is really dangerous. And I go, no, just tell me what I have to do, tell me where I can't be, tell me where I have to stay on track, and I'll do it. And when I do it, and it's successful, and it looks great, then everybody's happy. One of Hollywood's biggest stars today, Kevin Costner, almost found tragedy while filming his Academy Award-winning film, Dances with Wolves. There was 20 of us riding in the middle of this herd at full speed. And um, a horse got out of control and slammed into my horse and knocked me down. I just got up and Norman came over and he had my double horse there and I said, get off. And he did, you know, and I said, bridle that sucker up and he did. He's a good hand and got back into it. And I just kept riding. About two minutes later, we got a great shot out of it. John claude Van Damme one of Hollywood's action elite. It's been said that he combines the lethal grace of Bruce Lee with the romantic charm of Cary Grant. Men admire his martial arts expertise and women love his physicality, his suave charm and good looks. He's an actor who can blend action with lighthearted romance. His films have set box office records across America and Europe. He's one of the new superstars of action. Jean-Claude Van Damme. You're under arrest. Van Damme's first starring role came in 1987 in the Canon film Bloodsport. Bloodsport was the true story of Frank Dukes, a young American who, through strength and determination, trained for and won the deadly Kumatai, a legendary karate competition which continues today. I present myself to the Canon Group years ago. I sold myself like I show my muscle and kicks. I mean, I didn't speak so good English. Like Arnold years ago with his muscles, you know, he sold his muscles. And I sold my legs, you know, the karate and everything. And the guy was convinced 
And uh, of course, uh, Bloodsport was attached to Canon, but I came for a small part and they gave me a full movie. Not a big movie, a low budget. You know, uh, Bloodsport was a, a very low budget, but that movie made me, a, I don't like the word star, but you know, it gave me uh, an audience. Bloodsport made Jean-Claude known in America and a full-fledged star in Europe. But while the story of Frank Duke's rise to the championship was interesting, it was the authentic fight scenes that made Bloodsport a surprising success. All that style, all those kicking and jumping, kick 360, you cannot learn that in one week or one month. It takes you years to practice karate. And we have like wide angle. It was not like uh, five, six, seven cameras. All wide angle, so you, you, you see the, the full action. When I'm, I'm jumping eight feet high in the air, we don't see any trampoline. We see the guy taking off from the ground. To the, you know, it's, it's like, and kids, they're not stupid. Kids, they can, they can see when something is tricky or not. Although John claude has made his name with karate, the challenges posed by his early ballet training have also helped to prepare him for his on-screen career. Dancing is very difficult, and also it helped me to give me some grace. When I'm fighting, I don't want to be, I want to be graceful. So if you can kick somebody but with grace, it's like, like cram the like cram, you know? It's like, it's like Muhammad Ali when he was boxing. He's boxing, but he's dancing, he's moving, he's doing face. He's putting on a show. It's like, wow, it's beautiful. Fights like this one are shot from hundreds of camera angles over a period of several days. But it all begins with a sheet of paper and a pencil. Well, I come on the set, I look at the location, I go to my room on the weekend because there's only one day. Uh, and I arrange all the fight scene on a piece of paper where they position the cameras. And then we did the final fight, kickboxer, the final fight, in three days, the shooting. That's like 100 setups a day. Uh, it was great. In this final bout from kickboxer, the stakes are raised when his villainous opponent insists that they carry out a deadly ancient ritual. The old time they were fighting, and they, they dipped their hands in blue and broken glasses, and they were fighting like a tough fight. And uh, you know, it's like uh, we want to fight you the ancient way. So it was, it was great. Although scenes like this one look dangerous and realistic, the athletic ability of the actors limits any risk of serious injury. Still, one can imagine how difficult it would be to climb into the ring and play John Claude's opponent, knowing that those powerful kicks and punches are going to be flying at you. I control myself very well. And, and I, I mean, if, if, if something happens, it's because it's no coordination. Because the guy, uh, you, you, I mean, I, I, I never hurt anybody. I hurt only one guy in blood sport because when I elbow him, he came. He came from, was not supposed to come from. It was very difficult to understand. And I knocked him off. I mean, I took uh, something out. Also in cyborg, not, uh, you know, something happened. And it's, and it's bad for me because I feel like uh, it's nobody's fault, but you feel so sorry because those guys, you know, they're, they're there to make money and they work with you and they'll do, they'll give you the best, you know? They, and they respect you, so I feel so bad, and I say, stop, and I start to kiss the guy who I'm sorry, man, I'm really, I feel so bad, you know? Born in Brussels, Belgium, Jean-Claude freely admits that he was a skinny, sensitive kid who loved classical music and painting. As a youth, he was trained in ballet and karate. He turned down an opportunity to join the Paris Opera as a dancer to focus on karate and bodybuilding. By the age of 18, Jean-Claude was already a successful Belgian businessman, owning and managing his large fitness center in Brussels. But his heart was not in it. I was doing very good, money-wise. Uh, but I said, what am I doing here? I love movies. Am I going to stay the rest of my life here? So I talked to my parents, they say, are you crazy? Only 19, uh, you should take the money and invest, and you're gonna go, what, in America, to become a movie star? You? 
uh, Jean Claude, you don't speak English, you don't, you don't have any green, no green card, and you're gonna go and just. I said, I'll try. It was a big fight between me and my family, not because, I mean, they love me, they want good for me. And uh, for five years, I was pushing here every day. I mean, five, six years, nothing happened. It was very difficult. And many times I want to go back because I don't have nobody. I mean, I was, I was having no friends. You know, it's difficult when you come from another country. His career was just barely getting off the ground when he met Gladys Portuguese. Jean-Claude and I met, um, it's five years now, at Baja, California, at a photo shoot. When we were dancing finally in the discotheque, it's the last day, and he um, wouldn't dance with me, nor I didn't ask him to dance with me because I felt kind of funny, but I was wondering why he wouldn't ask me to dance with him, so I was getting very furious, a little upset. And I go over to him with my typical New York attitude, and I says, why won't you dance with me? And he says, oh, because I was waiting for you to dance with me. So we started to dance, but at one point when it really hit was when he took his shirt off and he had suspenders, and that was it. <laughs> She cracked up. Why did she say those suspenders? No, I fell in love then. I said, ooh, suspenders. Cling. So it's not me. She fell in love with my suspenders. No, and your green eyes. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Look at my eyes, please. Close up. The green or what? <laughs> After the success of Cyborg and Kickboxer, Van Damme was established as an international action star. And his next film was MGM's Death Warrant. In Death Warrant, Jean-Claude plays a Canadian cop we want to send you undercover into Harrison as a prisoner. The assistant warden was murdered. Might be linked to the deaths of some prisoners. Nine in the last few months. She's gravel. At the root of the killing spree is an old nemesis, the notorious Sandman, played by Patrick Kilpatrick. I walk on the set of that big factory, and again, I left, and I designed a fight on a piece of paper with ideas. Uh, it, it, it take a lot from you. And also the guy, the Sandman, was not a fighter. He's a good actor with a good face. He looked very strong. And the guy was very, it was, I was having a difficult time to show him how to throw a punch or a kick. So we came up with some ideas like, you know, that and him throwing me from the ceiling, then <laughs> It's difficult to build a fight scene from a script. You have to be on location. You always find special stuff. Welcome to hell! Despite his rapidly growing success, Jean-Claude still keeps in constant shape by following a strict, multifaceted training regimen. It's important for him that he runs and jogs because he's concerned about um, keeping your heart going and not being too stressed because in this kind of business is very stressful and you gotta keep yourself in great shape and try to keep up in keeping yourself in good shape because if not if you sort of say oh today I can't do it and before you t before you know it today it lands out to be 10 days later that you have not trained but he's very conscious and he's very prudent and um, he has to train and he has to work it's a drug once you've worked out for so many years, it's become a part of you, like a good relationship is a part of you, like when you have your kids, they're a part of you, you know. Here's the producer of Double Impact, Moshe Diamat. It's physical energy, it's amazing. I, I remember one scene, it was toward the end of the shooting of the movie in Hong Kong. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning, we're shooting a fight on this famous crane. And everybody was really tired. And he was fighting since dark, which was like at 7 o'clock in the evening. And everybody was sitting half dead. They were setting up the cameras for the next shot. And I saw Van Damme standing in the corner and doing sit-ups to pump up his, his muscles. And it's amazing. He's not using any artificial stuff, so he has to exercise nonstop. Training, it's not difficult. Training, it's easy because I love to train. What's difficult yes, 
when you're doing movies, you're thinking about the release, about the publicity, about the next one, the script, this, that, the position, that. And when you train, you have to take everything out and to be empty in your brain. Because when you train, to put on muscles, especially a small guy like me, I mean, a small guy, I'm not too small, but I was very small, but to, to, to become from small to big, you have to concentrate. You have to, to focus on, on your biceps, your chest, your back, and you have to for, forget everything about business. That's the difficult part. No, so we'll make two and one. It's kind of funny, like two yeah. Van Damme for the price you know? of one. Yeah, but it's free, but that's an expression, Jay. I know, I know. On TV, be <laughs> to be okay. successful in a movie, it's not only your physical stuff. You need something else. You need to know about the story. You need to feel for it. You need you need to to supervise the. Uh, you need to go on 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 publicity. You need to go on promotion. Uh, you need to help your director to fight against budget and to make sure he'll, he'll have everything he need. So it's it's almost like a. Uh, a huge polit political <laughs> a business, and you need that special twinkle in the eyes, you know. He's always charming, you know. He's he's a charmer, you know, and 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 everybody loves him, you know, for that. I think he's got something very special. He's got a spark, a real spark. Here's Double Impact. This film represented the greatest test of Jean Claude's acting skills to date. He'll be playing not one lead role but two twin brothers, Chad and Alex. To do a scene as one character and then play off that performance as another, a very different character required the utmost concentration. It's a lot of action, but also it's two different types of people, like a, a Charles Bronson uh, and a Chevy Chase, for example. And they both sing different, they have different mentality and different way of fighting and arguing and all that stuff, so it's... Alex, I think they screwed you. But let me see. Next time, I'll make the deal. <laughs> then you have to change the way, the, the way of uh, the, the way you talk, the way you move, the way you think, the way you fight, the way you react. It's all different, so it, it was not so easy. There were many special challenges in this movie. Um, first of all. All the twin effect shots, it's special effects, and it's very complicated. The process that we used was very, very complicated and advanced, so it will look convincing. And if you'll all see the movie, you'll see what I mean. You'll see, you see many times on the screen, him, I mean, two of, two of him, uh, fighting with, with himself, talking to himself. You have to shoot what we call two parts of the screen. So you shoot with one Van Damme a scene, then he has to go, change, take a shower. He took so many showers every day, poor guy. Uh, new makeup, and go do the scene again. So it's very slow, complicated, especially in the fights where the position has to be the same, the camera has to, have to stand the same place. <coughs> There is one fight sequence where he fights himself. It's a process of using Jean-Claude himself, twinning shots where you shoot the same shot twice, and doubles. And there's different doubles. There's a, a double for Chad, uh, a stunt double for Chad, and what we call a photo double for Chad. Then there's a stunt double for Alex and a photo double for Alex. And it's the interchangeability of these four doubles with the real Jean-Claude that it takes to actually create one fight. The movie was shot in Hong Kong and in LA. And in Hong Kong, it's the, the stunt people are amazing. They, the doubles, they don't mind to get really hit. It's not like here. They complain immediately. But in Hong Kong, you know, you can really hit them. And in fact, they're upset if you don't touch them. When they choreograph fights there, and they do a lot of fight movies, um, they're used to actually taking punches, not like straight out punches, but it's not the sort of flea flicker touch that people do in American movies. So Jean-Claude was actually able to make contact in slow motion with people. And when you see it, you know that he really hit these guys, as opposed to somebody who went like this, and they put a huge, big sound effect on it. Uh, so it looks more real. 
When you know Jean-Claude, you know that he is a person of boundless energy and boundless enthusiasm and overall boundless enthusiasm for the making of movies. Um, I never saw anybody work so hard on a movie before. He's a guy that's willing to learn. He's, a, he's, he's not afraid to learn. When he wants something in life, he goes for it 100%. And he gets it. He makes sure that that's the thing he's going to get. He owned a gym in Brussels. And when he saw me about, oh gosh, six years ago, seven years ago, I would say, he told his dad, he says, Dad, you see this girl? I'm going to marry her one day. And the father said, right, sure. Hey, Dad, I'm going to go to America and become a big star. You wait and see. Ah, don't leave. The gym is very good, or whatever have you. You're doing great here in Belgium. But Jean-Claude wanted more in life. I know, and I believe, he's going to be one of the biggest actors in the history and one of the biggest directors. Because that's, that's his thing. His thing is, more than acting, is directing. And he wants to make good films, beautiful films. He's an extreme perfectionist. I mean, he's got this love and this drive, a drive that I've, I've never seen in my life. It's nonstop. After watching his bone-crutching work on the screen, it may be hard to believe, but there's a gentler side to this superstar as well. John Claude and his wife, Gladys, are full supporters of the Make-A-Wish Foundation and the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Here's Jay Swartz, the public relations consultant to John claude Van Damme. He grants, you know, it, it's what the Make-A-Wish Foundation is. They grant wishes to terminally, terminally ill children and in the MDA Association, as you can see, of what he's doing here today. And he, he's with the kids, and you could watch the, the glow in their eyes after, you know, he talks to them or gives them an autographed picture. They, they look up to him, and it just it makes him feel good because these are the people that put him where he is today. So this is his way of giving back. Tell him, Jason. Hi, Jason. I got an autograph from Van Damme, and he did it. Hey, he's my pal. It's great when I can help some kid and to be there. I mean, just to be part of them, you know, to make them happy. It's, you have, it's, it's, it's a great feeling. And, and you have to be responsible for that. So sometimes when I'm doing, I think I'm doing something bad. Like if one day I'm like, oh, there's the other one to train. I think about those kids. And I go and I train hard. And those kids, um, I mean, it's part of it. I love people. It's because people I made in this business. Without those people, I was not, you know, what I am right now. So I love people. And I want to help people. I want to help. I want to do something nice in my life. It's better to do something nice than something bad. <laughs> it's so simple. Enjoyed your peek behind the scenes at the superstars of action. See you again on Hollywood Stunt Makers. Keep safe now.
Welcome to Hollywood Stunt Makers. Today we're going to have a look at the. Uh... <laughs> Now what I was saying, welcome to Hollywood Stuntmakers. Today on Hollywood Stunt Makers, we'll meet some of the most highly regarded stuntmen in the film business and check out some of their greatest hits. Plus, we'll meet some daring women, past and present, who do stunts. And we'll talk to some actresses who have done their own stunts. Terry Leonard's one of the top stunt coordinators working today. Here's a quick sampling of some of his best work. My favorite stunt in Blue Thunder was blowing that car in half on the bridge. Uh, Roy Scheider is protecting his girlfriend who's making a run to the TV station with the, the tape that incriminates the bad guys. And, and uh, this sequence was designed to shoot it in three pieces once the car gets blown in half. And uh, we didn't really have the time to set those three particular cuts that, so we went ahead and did it all at once. Of course, we've never blown the car in half. We don't know how it's going to handle. And we're up there on this bridge, and I'm looking at the effects guy and say, what happens if this thing takes off and goes over the bridge? I mean, <laughs> there isn't much car left around you. You know, it's kind of us against the concrete at the bottom. So I was driving the car, and Glenn Randall Jr. was the guy that blew it up when he hits the nail boards and has to hit the right nail so that the right pieces come apart. And the whole car came apart in half, and down the road we went. But it all worked, and uh, that, again, is a testimony of the effects guys, because they put all this stuff together, and uh, we're kind of a test pilot for those things. And sometimes they work, and most of the time they work. Sometimes they don't. So obviously, we had a question on just how far we could go with this car, and we've got to make about a run halfway down the bridge, and we're crashing and banging off of cars with just the front half of this automobile that's come apart. And I, I enjoyed that piece. How I got into the stunt business, I was attending college at the University of Arizona, and I'd work as a local extra down there. They made a lot of westerns back in the early 60s. And the first picture I ever worked on was a film called McClintock with John Wayne. And the guy that had doubled John Wayne from 1947 on, he and I became good friends, a guy named Chuck Roberson. So, uh, he said, if you're ever interested in becoming a stuntman, <laughs> which at that time I was just, you know, they'd pay you $20 a day and $5 a day extra if you got on a horse. So here I am 25 years later. My favorite stunt in Romancing the Stone, uh, I was hired on that picture as a stunt coordinator and second unit director, so I directed all the action sequences on the film as a director. I did one stunt as a stuntman, and that was taking the car off the waterfall. It isn't as good a stunt as I would like to have performed. I envisioned this great stunt where I was going to pull a big Greg Lagana. He just sailed right down the most prettiest swan dive you've ever seen. Well, it didn't work that way. I fell straight down with the car and hit in the impact zone of the waterfall. And uh, there was so much water coming over that it didn't let me out. So I was trapped. I was out of air. And for all intents and purposes, I was dead. And why I came out that one breath of air, I'll never know. But it wasn't my time to go, I guess. That was, that was a thrill. That was a strictly an adrenaline rush for me and Vince Dedrick Jr., who I had doubling Kathleen Turner, I was doubling Michael Douglas. 
We're in Malibu. And that's Paul Stater's house. He's one of the most respected men in the world of stunt making. And in this unlikely setting, some of today's busiest stuntmen train and practice their craft. All right, move around a little bit now. I want you to stretch out here. That's a problem. I always thought by starting a school, we needed something like that because too many guys were getting hurt because they didn't really know what they were doing. And being I had started in the old serial days where you had to do a three-minute fight, and to do a three-minute fight, you find yourself going over the same thing over and over and over again. That's a long fight. So they weren't throwing punches properly, and I just felt there was a need for that. And I'd been away for a while and, and made, made a lot of money on the picture, and I just, I just said, well, let's, let's start a little sense school. Come on. Let's go. It's, Good, OK. It, it's fun. It's a hobby of mine. It Come keeps on, me in shape when I meet the young people. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling younger all the time. <laughs> well, these demonstrations show that strength and size aren't the only qualifications for stunt work. Although these students are obviously enjoying themselves, they have to put in hours of practice to be able to work together smoothly and safely. I don't think working with stunt men and or Send women. I don't think there's any difference at all. You have to get inside of their head. You have to make them believe that they're doing this. They have to lose themselves, just like a real good actor. Good. That's the advice that I give a, a, a stunt person that's just starting out is, is I give them advice first, they should go to school, finish school. That's one of the first things I tell them. But if they really want to be a stunt man, I say it's a rough, rough road out there. And there's a lot of competition. And they just have to, to work hard and they learn their, their uh, fundamentals. It's your basic fundamentals. You have to learn them and learn them well. And it'll always come and help them out. <laughs> yeah! Yeah! Oh, yeah! Woo! Woo! Yeah. 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 They'll give an actor, they'll let, him, they'll let him blow his lines over and over again. But a stunt, a stunt man, he can't blow his lines. He's got to do it. Let's get some more details about Paul Stater's illustrious career and find out a little more about the techniques he uses today. Well, I got started back in about, oh, 1935, 36. I'd uh, had a good friend named Buster Crab, and I had tried out for the Olympics. As a matter of fact, I was on the Olympics as an alternate. And uh, I met Buster Crab and Johnny Weissmuller, and, and I used to dive off the La Monica Ballroom, which is around 80 feet. And uh, somebody saw me from Golden Studio, and they were making a big film at the time with John Ford as a director called Hurricane, and using an actor named John Hall who uh, actually his name wasn't John Hall at all, and he was from Fresno, but they said he was from Tahiti, and they went on and on. Well, I ended up doing the high dives in a picture, and, and uh, as you can see, it made me a millionaire. That's yeah. <laughs> that. The first stunt I ever did was uh, going into the studio and meeting Buster Crab, and he and I, I did the part of a shark man, and uh, Buster was doing Fleisch Garden, and we fought all day in a swimming tank, and I think that old tank is right there on the, on the Universal lot. Uh, and I was the shark man, and Buster Crab uh, was, of course, Fleisch Garden, and, and we fought all day underwater. The only people I doubled for, God bless their souls, they aren't in the business anymore, unfortunately, but more or less those guys like Cary Grant, Johnny Weiss Muller, they were just wonderful guys, and they didn't try to direct the picture, they didn't try to write the picture, they did what they were told to do. 
And uh, I, I worked an awful lot with, with those type of people. It was, it was really wonderful working for them. I, I think you'll remember this movie, Paul. I'd like to take credit for that dive, but that's a Paul Stater stunt all the way. I'm glad you were there, pal. Me too. <laughs> So if you meet somebody that you've known in the past, oh, well, you still working, you old pooch, you know, or something like that. So it's fun. And you, you just keep it, and, and I miss the business when I'm not working. Throughout the years, there's always somebody that's trying to, to save money, uh, and there's nothing like a human doing it. They're going through the air, their movements, their body movement, and you can't fool the public on that. But there's always a way to do that stunt. And the more experience that you've had, there's more ways that you can find to do it and to make it work. Did you see uh, Back to School? That dive at the end, that's my baby, that dive. What dive is he gonna do? The triple lending. Oh, you do it in cuts. The geek went off, left the picture. Now he enters the picture doing something else, and he enters the picture doing something else. And that's the way you do the thing, see? But it takes experience. Here, Rodney Dangerfield plays an overaged college student who finally gets some respect with this spectacular, if unorthodox, dive. Triumphant music and slow motion photography lend a touch of poetry to a comical stunt. When you've done something well, you can see it on, on, the, on the crew's face. Crews don't think they don't watch it. They watch it. They watch it. They want to see what's happening. They love it. I want you to meet Tom Morga, one of the most versatile stuntmen working today. He doubled for me in Hudson Hawk. Tom credits Paul Stater with starting his career. In fact, he refers to him as his mentor. Well, I uh, got started in the business uh, at least 16 years ago, and originally I was a smoke jumper with the U.S. Forest Service in Montana, and they um, filmed a segment of Wild Kingdom, and they used some smoke jumpers, and we did the obstacle course and a, and a parachute jump, fought some fire, and I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty fun. And <laughs> I'm from this area, so I came back and, and searched out uh, what you'd need to do and found Paul Stater and got started uh, just out of sheer interest. Tom Morgan is very versatile. I could say if something goes wrong with this fencing this morning, I could say, well, you know, we could put Tom in this costume right away, and Tom can do it. I have been asked to do stunts where um, it was not something I wanted to do. And in a case like that, where I've never refused to do a stunt, I've always been able to change something. And I think most stuntmen experience that the, what a director asks for. Um, you'll explain to him why it might not work why it would be better a different way to make it a little safer, uh, to make it easier, or even look better. Probably a good fight sequence is probably the hardest to pull off and make believable. Back in the days when we were all kids and watched those serials, of course, we remember these guys getting these monumental fist fights and they'd never lose their hat and there would never be any blood coming out of their mouth. And as we all know, all it takes is one good shot and the guy's down for the count. You know, but these things, would they'd fight forever. And I couldn't believe that this would occur. Got in the picture business and realized that the drama of the fight scene would require that. So uh, uh, I became a little softened in my appreciation of the motion picture fight routine. But that's probably the toughest. To do a good long fight and integrate your actors and, and stunt doubles takes a lot of thought. 
Here's how we choreographed that fight scene you saw at the top of today's show. Stunts that, that look hard but are actually easy, uh, that, that really depends on the situation. Sometimes a high fall uh, can be pretty easy as far as where you fall and how you do it, but it can look real difficult. The other way around, though, uh, to do a good fight uh, that may look easy, that's kind of difficult. To stage it, to make it look good, keep the energy up. When I choreograph a fight scene, first it's according to the script and what the director and the story calls for. So that's the first thing you're trying to do is create uh, a fight that works with that story. And then you have to take into consideration, of course, the set, uh, the elements that uh, you're working with, and sometimes there's a story point, a knife or a gun. So all those things have to be considered and in, in, in put into the fight. And then, of course, it has to look real. And then you're always concerned with your camera angles and uh, how you're gonna how you're gonna stage the fight so you can get some good looking action that will show up on film and good places to put your your star in close-ups in preparing for a stunt um, mentally, it's, it's um, having confidence in your equipment, in your procedures, or what you plan to do. In other words, uh, it's all the, all the planning and preparation that goes into putting a stunt together mentally uh, prepares you for that stunt. So by the time you're ready to do it, you, you're pretty, pretty well comfortable with everything that you have to do. Here's Timothy Dalton, Hollywood's newest James Bond, offering his views on the importance of safety in stunt making. It must never be dangerous. You've got to work it in a carefully and rigorously controlled way. If anyone got hurt, and if anyone got killed, as has happened tragically, for what? For a movie? I mean, that, that must never happen. And one must take every, every step to ensure that it doesn't. And that's where our stuntmen and special effects men come in. They are brilliant and skilled. And if you work with them carefully, with great discipline, you know, you can, uh, you can involve yourself in the, in the stunts, in the action, as I think one must, but it should never be dangerous. It should look very dangerous and very exciting, but it shouldn't be. The biggest mistakes in the stunt business occur when the stunt is so simple that it doesn't really demand your full mental attention, and I, uh, that's when you get hurt. I've really never been seriously hurt doing a stunt. I've had a couple little uh, minor breaks. I broke a foot, and... Uh, or dislocated something maybe, but I've never had any real serious injuries. I've been in the hospital a few times, and I've had a hip replaced here, and I've got to have a hip replaced there uh, this summer sometime, and that's a result of concussion injuries. When we did a lot of those old westerns, you know, you get off on a road about that hard, wrecking a wagon or doing a saddle fall or a horse fall, but the horse fall, of course, the ground's prepared, but half the time you're doing these saddle falls and backovers and stuff, you don't prepare the ground, you don't have time. So you take a pretty good knocking. My favorite stunt in Apocalypse Now is when we blew that helicopter up. One of the soldiers on the ground in the schoolhouse got his leg blown off. So they're bringing a medevac helicopter and Duval is yelling, I want my men out of there now. I want my men out. Back in Nam, they just dropped those choppers down for a short period of time, and they took off. So you had to gather your wounded, put them in the chopper, and take off. Of course, the longer they're on the ground, the quicker they, the better chance they have of getting shot down. So we rigged a deal where four of us were in there, Steve Boyum, Joe Finnegan, Kerry Russell, and myself, where we actually flew a helicopter in the movie. It looks like it's 10 feet off the ground. And then a little girl comes up, and as the helicopter's lifting off, she turns around and hook shots a grenade into the helicopter, and of course, this thing So we had three guys in full fire suits. Kerry Russell gets blown out as a door gunner. He gets blown 20 feet out. And the helicopter, all in one shot, crashes to the ground. And that, to me, was really a, a great moment in that film. I think the future for action movies is, is, is great. It's, it's getting greater. There's, there's more demand for it. Uh, there's more demand for more technology. Uh, films themselves, there's more effects. Uh, and there's more excitement. So there's always going to be a demand, and I think it's, it's, it's a growing demand.
the beautiful Anne Archer. Tells us how she got more than she bargained for, doing her own stunts for the film Narrow Margin. I did all the, the sequences on the train at the end. The reason actors like to do their own stunts is that it ensures the reality of the scene. And sometimes, it can be really scary. Those were not backdrops, that was me. <laughs> we were cabled, but uh, as I used to bitterly complain to our director, Peter, Peter Himes, I don't want to fall and find out what it feels like to get saved by the cable. So I would complain a lot, hoping that they wouldn't ask me to do anything worse than they already asked me to do. And then he would, he would use psychology on me and he'd say, now, Anne, uh, I don't want you to do anything that you're really uncomfortable with. And at that point, I would feel very guilty. And so I'd make myself do it. The safety cable attaching the actress to the train had to be creatively hidden to ensure total safety while giving audiences the illusion that real danger exists. In this death-defying sequence, where Gene Hackman's character battles the villain, close-ups of the stars are intercut with footage of stuntmen. These trained risk-takers do this kind of work for a living, but considering the speed of the train and the treacherous terrain, you can rest assured, they employ the exact same safety precautions used by Ann Archer. As with any action scene, numerous cameras were placed in various positions on the train and on the helicopters to allow for fast-paced cutting. It was very scary and I was really scared and it was hard to do. And, um... Uh, I'm glad I did it now. I don't know if I'd do it again. <laughs> Here's the Academy Award-winning actress Kathy Bates in the psychological thriller Misery. Any other crucial requirements that need satisfying? Uh, just the, the paper will be fine. Are you sure? Because if you want, I'll bring back the whole store for you. Annie, uh, what, what's the matter? What's the matter? I'll tell you what's the matter. I go out of my way for you. I do everything to try and make you happy. I feed you, I clean you, I dress you, and what thanks do I get? Oh, you bought the wrong paper, Annie. I can't write on this paper, Annie. Well, I'll get your stupid paper, but you just better start showing me a little more appreciation around here, Mr. Man. Annie really drives the piece. She really, uh, um, she's the protagonist, you know, and, and, and she makes the thing go, and, and whereas the character of Paul is more responsive and reactive. You know, so it took a lot of gas to get through that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is my first lead in a picture, and, and with a director like Rob Reiner, you know, that's enough to get you up and going in the morning. And, and uh, he had a terrific group of people on the set, a great crew, just great people. And so it was a real joy to go to work every day. So I, that kind of fired me up every morning, you know, kept me going. We had some doubles that did some of the longer shots, but we did about 95% of it ourselves, and uh, that was a unique experience for me, because <laughs> I've never done anything like that before. Mm. And uh, so that was uh, that was amazing experience to me, because uh, you were exhausted by the end of the day, and the next day you were so sore you could hardly walk, you know, and you just had to forget it and just throw yourself into it. Boy, I don't want it on my conscience that I burned up Captain Fates. At the end of the movie, it's okay, it's okay. if you die, but not at this point. No, 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 not misery! Although this fight looks dangerous, the filmmakers go to great lengths to avoid injury to the star, which could set production back for months. Special effects makeup serves to enhance Ms. Bates' performance. The use of fake blood in the shot helps to sell the idea that the actress is embroiled in a fight for her life. It took us about five or six days, you know, to shoot that whole sequence, and Annie got progressively, uh, you know, more bloody and more beat up and bruised and stuff. So that was weird, you know. I didn't get to sit with people and eat at lunch with them. I had to kind of go hide in my trailer because <laughs> you didn't want to inflict that on somebody while they were eating, you know. To misery. To misery. 
RoboCop was one of the most successful action pictures in recent history, and also one of the few films that features a woman as a hands-on crime fighter. Nancy Allen and Peter Weller portray cops in futuristic Detroit, hunting down the bad guys. Stuntwoman Ginny Epper doubles for Nancy Allen in this high-speed chase through the inner city, an example of the necessity for the stuntwoman today. But in the early days of movie making, when a scene called for a dangerous stunt involving a woman, it was usually done by a man. All the driving, riding, falling, and jumping needed for action films was performed by a man in a dress until it was time for the close-up. Stunts were considered too dangerous or too difficult for a woman to handle. This was in the early 1900s, after all. Filmmakers simply counted on audiences not looking too closely. In this scene, a woman is clearly riding the horse. But when it's time to jump from the horse to the stagecoach, a man steps in. Of course, there was a select group of women who went against the grain of Hollywood and insisted on doing their own stunts. These were the serial stars, such as Pearl White, who began her career in 1914 with The Perils of Pauline, and Helen Gibson in The Hazards of Helen. In this scene from D.W. Griffith's Way Down East, that's really Lillian Gish and Richard Bartholomus acting with real ice and a real waterfall. This was shot in 1919 long before stunt making evolved into a precise science, so safety precautions were minimal. Watch how close these daring actors get to the very brink of disaster. It wasn't until the 1930s until things really started to change. Women began doubling for female stars. The first stunt women had backgrounds as diverse and as wild as their personalities. They were fearless and attempted amazing feats. We're lucky to have two pioneers in the world of stunts who are still working, Lila Finn and Mae Boss. I got started in the business coming from a rodeo background. I was a trick rider with rodeos. And I actually had no inclination to be a stunt woman. And consequently, I was called to do a stunt and I really didn't know what I should be doing. I mean, I said, I, I just have an extra card. And they said, well, you dummy, go get your Screen Actors Guild card. And it just sort of evolved from that. The first stunt I, I did, actually, I replaced a girl on a series called Country Doctor, which involved driving teams, falling horses. It was all horsework. It was a little Country Doctor Western. And so I learned a great deal right there on the set. You know, you have to have a background of some sort. And as I said, I was a trick writer. I came in that way. And of course, there were, at the time I came into the business, westerns were big. So I just sort of went from one to the other. But I did almost nothing but horse work at one time. But you can't do that now. You've got to be able to be very well-rounded, you know? High falls, fights, the whole bit. And, You've got to work at that. Olympic swimmer Lila Finn got started in the acrobatic and water stunts. It was a chance to go to Samoa. And I had returned from Berlin in the 1936 Olympics. And I thought, oh, this is great. So I went down to Samoa, double, double Dorothy Lemoore, and spent a month on the island of Samoa. Well, the first stunts were mainly diving off the boat, diving from a cliff, swimming in the ocean with sharks and that type of thing. And then especially when there was the hurricane, then I doubled her in the hurricane also. After getting a taste of stunt work in her early 20s, Lila set out to promote her skills. She sent out copies of this film with the hope that movie producers would hire her as a stunt woman. Really, the business has not changed that much, I don't feel. Uh, the men that hire you, are, they hire you because they know your ability. And you, well, number one is you never take a job you cannot do. That is the key to my staying in the business this long. 
Lila's athletic training made her stunt work look easier than it was. But even veteran stunt people can get second thoughts about their work. Do I ever get scared? Yes. There are times your heart really pumps. You know, in places where you sometimes don't have a lot of control. In the blockbuster hit Total Recall, a mountain explodes and a Mars settlement gets torn apart. May Boss portrays one of the hapless victims in this catastrophe, having to act amid explosions, breaking glass, smoke, and wind. The Academy Award-winning special effects are impressive, but to make the scene really work, a large number of both male and female stunt actors are needed. We can do just about anything that a man can do. Uh, an interesting part of stunt work, especially as far as I'm concerned right now, is that I'm doing plain parts, and then there'll be an action, something in it. But that is primarily what I'm doing now, a little dialogue, a little part, and then some action. Instead of doubling for a star, here Lila plays a small role as a character who finds herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. The near miss is created without the aid of trick photography or clever editing. It's a true to life close call. So timing, concentration, and nerves of steel are crucial. Being a stunt woman has been a wonderful career and I still love it. Still want to do all the jobs I can handle. You've got to stay in shape. I, I've always said I'll probably be doing push-ups in my wheelchair. You've heard of a doctor taking his son into his practice and a lawyer bringing his son into his firm. I'd like you to meet two women who are carrying on another family tradition, stunt work. Here are Jeannie and her daughter, Yerlene Epper. It was Jeannie who was the stunt woman for Nancy Allen in Robocop. This doesn't exactly look like a career a mother would want to pass on to her children, but Jeannie Epper has actually encouraged her daughter to follow in her footsteps. I've never tried to stop my children from doing stunts because Erlene, if she decides to take something, she's bright enough and smart enough to know whether yeah, she's capable. I would never capable. take something that I was not capable of doing. She might call me and say, you know, Mom, you know, they called me and asked me to do an 80-foot high fall. I'm not too sure. And then I'll say, well, who's coordinating it and who are the effects people? And you just, you know, through the business, through the years of working in this business, you know who to trust and who not to trust. When my daughter does stunts, um, I totally trust her because you've got to realize that my children have been listening to this. They listen to their grandfather talk about stunt work. They've listened to their mother, their uncles, their aunts. They've been raised, we're probably the largest stunt family in, in Hollywood. They know more in that little computer of theirs than most you know, they, every day they hear this. It was, it's like talking at the dinner table at night. You talk about stunt work, what you did for the day, how you, how you rigged this, what the safety aspects were. So I felt that when my kids decided to do this for a living, because I have two sons that do it also, that they were mentally prepared. Jeannie and Yerlene got the opportunity to work together when stunt coordinator Terry Leonard brought them to Mexico for the film Romancing the Stone. I think my most favorite probably was doing Romancing the Stone when I got to go down and do the second unit work, doubling Kathleen Turner and doing all the stuff in the Bronco, all the car work and passenger. And that was really fun because I got to be down there with my mom and Terry Leonard and it was a really fun job. Romancing the Stone was probably the most challenging, most exciting mixture of feelings I've ever had in a film. Um, when Terry Leonard called me and asked me if I wanted to do this particular film, I wasn't sure about going away for three months. The mudslide that I did on Romancing the Stone was probably the most physically demanding thing I've ever done in my life. Okay, let's make some time. You I was wet, cold, scared. You know, the mountain was almost straight up and down. It was so steep that we had to shoot it in like 40 to 50 to 60 feet at a time. They laid a cargo net up against the mountain. That's the only thing that we had to stop, stop you know, our body from traveling so fast. It was about a 300-yard run, and the top of this hill, it went straight down. Now, the trees that were there, obviously, we couldn't pull them out, so we had to design this waterway 
that gets filled with water to propel them down in the different sections in and out of the trees. And we had to stop them at the end of the run when they're out of camera. When you're going that fast, you're grabbing on, you know, to stop yourself into the cargo net. And I, mean, I almost got a dislocated shoulder one day. One day I got tipped upside down. My face got full of mud. I thought I was going to drown. No, it wasn't fun. It became a very difficult stunt because they're getting drowned by water all the way down. All the mud that got in their eyes and stuff, they'd have to wash their eyes out between takes. So after about four or five times, it becomes a job. It's no longer fun. And we did this for two weeks. Now, the current chairperson of the United Stunt Women's Association, J.D. David. Being a black woman in the business has actually been somewhat of an asset for me. I know that someone might look at it and say, well, you know, the opportunities may have been less, but like I said when I first started, there was just a need for me. There were no black stunt women over, I think, five foot six. So um, the opportunities were wide open. I mean, when I first started, I couldn't believe the jobs that I got. It was the age of the black exploitation films. And there was Teresa Graves and um, uh, Pam Greer and, you know, tall women who needed stunt doubles. And so, I mean, I couldn't believe this was like great. It just was mushroomed for me. Since I started in the business, the business has evolved into more of a technical kind of business. It used to be more sort of crash and burn, and now things are real high tech, um, um, demanding. The stunts have gotten huge, huge as far as I'm concerned. I mean, they've got they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's more things demanded of us. As you know, as each day goes by, as each show goes by. They just, you know, it just, it just gets larger and larger what they demand. In modern films, women are becoming more involved in action sequences. A brutal fist fight used to be a performance for men only. But scenes like this one from Total Recall indicate that women too can be convincing in aggressive roles. One might wonder if women have had difficulty being accepted within the male-dominated occupation of stunt doubling. Here are some thoughts from women who know. When I began in the business, the men accepted us, uh, just like they do now. I've had very good acceptance in the business by men. Um, I know I, like, I was probably the first woman to do a horse fall. And when you start doing things like that, there's respect. You earn your respect by being good at what you do. And I'm not saying that, you know, I've been perfect at everything, because I haven't. But I feel like um, I've earned the respect through hard work, good stunt work, honesty, saying yes, I can, and no, I can't. Because most stunt coordinators that hire me know that if I say I can do it, I, I will do my best to do it. And if I can't do it, I can't do it. You know, stunt people do need big egos. I mean, it's real difficult to go out there and literally risk your life without a good reason. And I think an ego, like thinking you're great, is like one of the best reasons for risking your life. Well, that's about all there is today. Do you ladies need a little help over there? No, we've got it under control. Got it. Isn't it amazing what great condition women are in today? Well, see you next time on Hollywood Stuntmakers. Keep safe. <laughs>